I feel like I'm an expert on forgiveness, on knowing that I didn't want to forgive and knowing that for a number of years I didn't forgive. And so I know those feelings of refusing to forgive because it just, just doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. Uh, it, it doesn't seem just. And indeed, uh, my focus of attention uh, was my father. We were in a very unusual situation uh, as a family. When you're a family off on the side and your father's actually married to someone else, you see life in a very different position. You're, you're seeing life not just as an intact family. You're observing many, many other fathers. And part of the issue was even when later on my parents did marry, my dad wasn't a daddy. He wasn't a fatherly kind of person. He was a businessman, uh, very successful, but he basically said um, Christianity's a crutch. He let us know that we could not talk at the table. Uh, we had nothing to contribute as children. At times he was cruel with his words, and I one day went up to my mother and said, how can you be so nice to him? Now, she said, oh honey, he doesn't know the Lord. If he only knew the Lord, he wouldn't be that way. I just was amazed at her words um, because I was focusing on his fault and I could see the faults. She was focusing on his need and he needed a changed life through Christ. At that point in time, my mother's life had tremendously changed because we got into a biblically-based church. We were around authentic Christians, not just Christians in name only. And I wish I could tell you that once I understood a little bit about forgiveness that I immediately responded. I, I didn't. Um, but her words became the turning point for me to not focus on the fault, but focus on the need. And it dawned on me, I had not prayed for him. In fact, um, if anything, I had prayed, God, just get him. You know, just let him know how wrong he is. I, I So in that respect, I did pray. But uh, the Bible says, pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. I remember looking at that scripture. Again, I was new to scripture, and Matthew 5, didn't make sense because how can you love your enemy? That, that would seem impossible. Well, I didn't understand the word love actually means to do what is in the best interest of the other person. That's agape love. Um, that's the highest form of love. And I was just a sponge that was just absorbing biblical truth, but it also had to make sense because I was very logical. My mind thought very logically. Because my father had a lifestyle of infidelity, uh, immorality with other women, um, I, I had this equation because I'm very logical. God hates sin. Dad is sinning. God hates dad. I hate dad. Logical. And I really thought I was right. I did learn that I could be sincere and sincerely wrong. Because you see, when I began to see how my mother treated lovingly my father, when I had only judgment toward him and resented how he treated her, she was not focusing on his fault. She focused on his need. And he did need a changed life through Christ. There was a point in time when I thought, have I ever 
thanked my father for the roof over the head, food on the table, books for school. I began to realize I had been an ungrateful daughter. And that's one of the most painful things for parents. Ingratitude. Because kids are not aware of all the sacrifices that parents make in behalf of them. And so I remember the day when I went to him and asked if I could talk with him. He was reading a newspaper and I said, Dad, could I speak with you? And his glasses were perched down on his nose and he looked up at me and I said, I've come to realize I've been an ungrateful daughter. I've never thanked you for providing a roof over my head, food on the table, books for school. And I need to ask your forgiveness. Would you be willing to forgive me? He said something rather unusual. He just paused for a long time, and finally he said, the pleasure was all mine. And he went right back to his newspaper. I thought, the pleasure was all mine. I mean, I, but you know, even though that seemed strange, that kind of response, the truth is, I didn't see it at the time, but over a period of time, I recognized that there was a change in our relationship. And I began to look for ways to be loving toward him. Because if the Bible says, love your enemies, well, he was like an enemy to me. There were some cruel things he had done toward me. And it dawned on me, how can I be loving? So I would look for ways, anything I could do that would be meaningful. And uh, he was always misplacing this red address book. I mean, it would either be in the library or in his bedroom. It could be in the kitchen or the dining room. But, but it dawned on me, he would bark out, Where's my address book? Where's my address book? And so I thought, okay, what can I do that's most loving? I will find the red address book. And when he comes home, if he asks for it, I will go get it. And sure enough, we were at dinner that night. Where's my address book? I said, I know where it is, Dad. I'll be happy to go get it. And I went and got it, brought it back to him. I said, here you are. Now, I'm sure by that time his teeth were chattering on the floor because of my changed attitude. I was wrong in my attitude. I thought, actually, he was the one wrong, at least 98% wrong. I was only 2% wrong. That's how I saw it. But you know, I was still responsible for my 2%. And that's why I needed to go to him and ask forgiveness for being ungrateful for what he had provided. What I found through that experience with him is <laughs> freedom. There is freedom through forgiveness. And at times we can be in bondage to bitterness. And we are the ones who need to be set free by asking, would you forgive me? And then have a humble heart and let God do the rest. I typically am not prone to depression, but I know what it's like to have my heart pressed down to feel pain, to feel, why is this happening? And for me to experience this for a period of time. I never really liked slapstick comedy. Uh, I remember being in pain uh, growing up, and I remember one of the big superstars was coming to the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas. I lived in Dallas, and uh, our friends in school, uh, just probably seventh grade, oh, let's go to the Cotton Bowl and see him. And the kids were saying, yes. And I remember saying, yes. 
And yet, my mind said, why would you want to go to the Cotton Bowl and see him? The world is so serious. I don't know why I remember those words. The world is so serious. Obviously, it was my world was so painful. And I remember at age 14, sitting at the piano bench. I remember thinking, I believe my mind is going to break. My mind is going to break. That isn't exactly normal. I don't know of anybody else that I've heard who who've actually said those words, but my heart was hurting so much. I hurt for my mom. I hurt for our family. Um, I just felt my dad was so cruel. And um, there had been some physical violence toward me, but I wasn't concerned about that. I cared about my mom. I wanted to be her protector. And I couldn't. I did my best, but I couldn't really protect her. And so I just thought, this is horrible. I, I just couldn't see any way out. Of course, I had no idea that God was ultimately going to use that kind of pain so that we would have a ministry called Hope for the Heart. Because at that point, I did not have hope. My heart was so pressed down that I couldn't see any hope. And I'm just so glad that God has a very different perspective. I, I remember one time looking at the Bible and noticing some specific words. By the way, th three times this verse is mentioned. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? That's stated in Psalm 42, two times, two different places in Psalm 42, and it's also same words in Psalm 43. Yet, that's not all of the verse. The second part is, Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. Now, I did a little study on sheep. I learned that sheep can be cast down. When we see the word downcast, just flip it around, cast down. If a sheep is cast down, that means, well, let's say a sheep starts going into the water to drink. There's a stream. It's imperative to have a shepherd because sheep can literally lose their lives without a shepherd. If the sheep is in the stream drinking the water, the fleece can get so water heavy that all of a sudden the sheep is cast down, the sheep goes down, the feet go up, and ultimately the sheep cannot get itself righted. In other words, the sheep dies. The sheep dies without a shepherd. At times, we can be waterlogged. In that respect, I think I was waterlogged during that period of time. Everything was so heavy. I think I probably could have looked to God like I was upside down, turned over, my feet up in the air. I needed a shepherd. I will forever thank God that I was introduced into a life-changing relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Good Shepherd, presented in the Bible, the Good Shepherd, who knows his sheep, who takes care of his sheep. And in truth, during that very, very dark period of my life, I experienced him as literally enabling me to walk and stay upright. I humbled my heart. I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. 
I did not deserve forgiveness. I did not deserve mercy. I didn't deserve grace. And yet he chose to give it to me in the Lord himself. And even though I couldn't see the way out, he did. And the only reason why I think my life has any meaning and purpose is only truly because of his mercy toward me. He is the merciful, consistent, good shepherd. And he does take care of even little sheep like me who really, who really wanted to die. He really became the shepherd of my soul. And that's the bottom line. He will be the shepherd of the soul of anyone who's willing to entrust their lives to him. No one wants to be depressed. Everyone wants to feel exhilarated, happy, uplifted. So depression kind of is a bummer for us all. Uh, if you feel down, down, you want to change. You think about, well, wait a minute, what's this deal about depression? Well, the truth is, depression is not new. Depression literally means a condition of being pressed down to a lower position, like a footprint in the sand. Depression can describe an emotional heaviness that weighs down the heart. Uh, I want you to think about this. I, I have an iron here, and uh, I have a pillow. Uh, this pillow says, I love you. I will always love you. Even if you unwove me, I will never unwove you. Obviously, there's a bit of a difficulty uh, with people feeling unloved, unwoved. The, that can press the heart down. Now, there's a natural time of feeling pressed down. I want you to think about this. If we were to take this iron and put it on this pillow, this is a foam pillow, it presses the foam down. Now, it's no big deal if you just immediately take it off. It comes right back. But the weight of putting it down, if it is staying down, then it is in a state of depression. And with most pillows, when you take the iron off, the foam does not come back. It stays down. So the heart can be pressed down, painfully so especially when there is a state of depression. Sometimes when we hear depression, it's a state, a psychological state that exists when the heart is pressed down and unable to experience joy. Those suffering with depression feel trapped underneath a dark, pervasive canopy of sadness, grief, guilt, hopelessness. Actually, depression is an umbrella term that covers feelings ranging from mild discouragement to intense despair and hopelessness. No matter the degree of darkness, the Lord wants us all to rely on Him to provide light. Psalm 18 says, You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. I'm going to pose to you four types of depression. Number one, just normal depression. I call this situational depression, or it can be called reactive depression. This happens to us all. It's an involuntary sadness based on a reaction to a painful situation. Normal problems of life press the heart down for a short period of time. For example, at a time when you've been rejected 
or you've failed, you didn't anticipate failing, or, or it can't even be an illness. Sometimes a depression can occur during a transitional stage of life. Um, I'm talking about uh, the mom or dad who has now, for the first time, the empty nest. All the children are gone. They're no longer at home. Uh, it's called the empty nest syndrome. Sometimes there can be midlife crises. Oh, I didn't fulfill what I thought I would in life. I, I don't know what to do with my life. I didn't meet the expectations I had for my own self. Sometimes there are major moves. Sometimes it's a physical issue, uh, all the way from menopause uh, to a, a physical illness that can cause depression. And a second type of depression is masked depression. Uh, this is a hidden depression. Um, I remember being in Russia one time and the man who did all the translation for my speaking, uh, at the end of the time I was there, after a number of days, uh, this man's wife came up to me and said, would you talk to my husband? Uh, he has, uh, he's a professor here, he teaches at the seminary, and uh, he did all your translation. And he has been helped beyond measure because of your teaching on depression. And I said, I'd be happy to talk with him. Well, what I learned was he read and translated our material on masked depression. And he said, now I see. Now I, I understand. I said, well, what have you masked? And he said, oh, I don't want to talk about it. I said, well, in order to fully get over it, you're going to really need to talk about it. Oh, I don't want to go into it. I don't want to think about it. I said, well, let's, you just tell me. Tell me what was so painful. And then he talked about a father who totally ignored him. Um, totally rejected him because he was brainy and his brother was the athlete. Well, the father loved the fact that he had a son that was the athlete and said, why aren't you like him? And so he was rejected, rejected, rejected until finally one day, the man that I was talking with, he became a medical doctor all of a sudden. After all these years, the father accepted him until he became a Christian, gave his life to Christ, and then decided he would teach at a seminary. Well, the father totally rejected that and therefore totally rejected him. And so he was in a state of depression. Why? Because of this situation. It was a situation. And he had masked the pain. But now he was dealing with the pain and admitting it and he got it out. And so we did a timeline, a literal timeline of every bit of pain he had in his youth, in his uh, young adult years, and then in his uh, adult years now. Well, to do that and then to release that pain to the Lord and let the Lord be his need meter, it made all the difference in the world in this godly man. That issue of mass depression is a state of enduring sadness based on unresolved, buried conflict. Painful feelings are denied or covered up. Therefore, recovery takes longer because of the failure to do the work needed. In other words, working through the pain. There's an interesting scripture in Proverbs 14, 13. Even in laughter, the heart may ache and joy may end in grief. So it's vital that we not live with masked depression. A third type of depression, I'm just calling neurotic depression. You know, any person with a depressive disorder has a clinical depression. And let me explain that word disorder. Disorder means it interrupts normal processing of life or normal living of life. And it's not being able to live life in a healthy way. So there needs to be a diagnosis and a treatment based on direct ongoing 
supervision. That's what's called clinical depression. This is a prolonged state of sadness lasting longer than the normal time frame expected for emotional recovery. And this is based on uh, the loss of endeared relationships, uh, a loss of finances, loss of work, um, retirement. Now this last type of depression is psychotic depression. It's the most severe type of depression. It's based on a loss of contact with reality. Loss of reality. Many people who experience a psychotic break, mean it, that means that they have broken with reality. And this is why it needs to be treated by a professional who understands depression. Sometimes you can think of depression in two camps. Uh, unipolar and bipolar. Most people are used to the word bipolar. What's unipolar? Well, think about the Olympics. If you've ever watched the Olympics, you see uh, the pole vault, and you have this runner who runs with this long, long, long pole, and finally there's a point at which the vaulter plants the pole at a specific point and then jumps over the bar. Well, I think of unipolar as one point down. It's characterized by one extreme, emotionally low state of depression. In other words, it is depression. Whereas there is something called bipolar. The bi means two, polar means pole. So think of the top part of the pole and the bottom part of the pole. It used to be called manic depression. Basically, this is when someone goes extremely low. In fact, it can mean sometimes being suicidal to an extreme high of a manic phase. And that's when they have rapid speech. They can buy impulsively, spending a lot of money. They, they are exceedingly and excessively high. That is a bipolar disorder. Some people ask this question, is depression the result of sin? Well, depression, well, the answer is yes and no. It all depends. Depression is not a result of sin when your heart grieves over normal losses. If the closest person in your life just died, that means your heart is pressed down. And the Bible even says, there's a time to weep. There's a time to mourn. That's in Ecclesiastes 3. Likewise, if your body is experiencing natural loss, um, I'm talking about just aging. Uh, there are certain things in the body chemistry that can change, uh, that, that can become compromised, and that can cause a sadness. The, the Bible even says, outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So we need to learn to literally trust the Lord in those situations and, and let Him be our life. Enable Him to give us victory when we see that we cannot do the things that we used to be able to do. Uh, he is the power source for us for change, and we can claim, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Just say that as a prayer. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, meaning anything that God calls you to do, calls you to be, you can be in His strength. Going back to our question, is depression caused by sin? Well, it can be a result of sin when you're depressed over the consequences of your own sinful actions and you don't attempt to change. Or you hold on to self-pity, anger, and bitterness when you've been wronged instead of choosing to forgive. The Bible says anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. Likewise, you can have depression if you continually choose to blame God and others for your unhappiness if you choose to let others control you instead of allowing Christ to be in control of you. 
Or if you're willfully choosing to stay in sin, although you're taking the Lord's Supper, that's uh, an ordinance in the church, remembering with reverence that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, yet you're continuing to stay in sin, uh, I want you to listen to this scripture. In 1 Corinthians 11.30, the Bible says, This is why many of you are weak and sick. It's because we just refuse to change. Consider this wrong belief that many people live with. I'm depressed over the deep disappointments in my life. They've robbed me of all joy. There's no hope for my future. And there's nothing I can do about it. Well, at times we don't have joy, but consider this right belief. I admit I'm depressed over the circumstances of my life, but Christ lives in me, if you're a Christian, and he is my hope. I will rely on him to renew my mind with his truth and renew my heart with his hope. The scripture says, In our hearts we felt the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises from the dead. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Have you struggled at times with depression, and, and you're just not sure what to think? Well, I consider thinking God's thoughts as an essential part of God's plan to help you not stay in depression. In Psalm 27, we read, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let me talk about five different ways to counteract depression. You are body, soul, and spirit. And the soul is your mind, will, and emotions. So body, the mind, the will, the emotions, and the spirit. Five different ways. So let's begin with the body. If you're suffering with a prolonged depression, first and foremost, get a thorough medical checkup. Not just going in for a checkup, but tell the doctor that you feel unusually depressed. Be specific. Ask the doctor to evaluate all medications you're taking and eliminate whatever is unnecessary. Ask your doctor if any of your medications could contribute to your feelings of depression. If so, could a substitute be prescribed? Number two, develop regular habits of sleep. Sleep is actually therapeutic. Only during the deep sleep, it's called the REM cycle, only during REM does the brain produce serotonin, which alleviates depression. So set a regular time to go to sleep and to rise. Number three, maintain a regular active schedule. Be actively involved in outside functions, such as uh, being, meeting with friends, being in a Bible study, uh, certain activities that bring you joy or have brought interest to you. It could be beginning to do something you've always wanted to do. Maybe you've always wanted to uh, learn about photography or, uh, or stained glass. You know, accept invitations to be with others, even if you don't feel like it. Number four, eliminate stress. Avoid being overly fatigued. Set aside some quiet time of relaxation. Uh, eat nutritious meals. Another point that has been amazingly helpful to people is, and some people don't like the word, exercise. Just walking fast, jog, swim, uh, at least four times a week, 20 minutes of brisk walking releases what are called endorphins. That's a natural mood elevator. 
And I, I've, and I found it interesting. I have a, a niece who was feeling depressed. She had moved to another state where there was very little sunshine. And so all of a sudden, she had SAD, S, seasonal affective disorder, uh, which means she needed light. So spend time in the sun enjoying God's beautiful creation. Pet a pet. I, that may sound ridiculous, but giving affection to an animal lowers blood pressure, relieves stress, and allows an increase in those feel-good mood chemicals. And how about this? Laughing out loud literally releases positive feel-good chemicals into our system. Some people choose to read funny stories, watch uh, funny movies, um, literally for therapy. Proverbs 17.22 says, A cheerful heart is good medicine. Now that's the body. What about the soul? The soul, again, is the mind, will, and emotions. What about your mind? What your mind dwells on can be a key ingredient to overcoming chronic depression. Research verifies that what a person chooses to think about literally changes the chemistry of the brain. The Bible says in Romans 12, 2, that we are transformed by the renewing of the mind. So write out several scriptures on index cards. Read them several times a day. Make a list, my Thanksgiving list, and then literally write out specifics that you can thank God for every day. How about uh, during the next week? List seven more specifics for which you can thank God. Just keep adding to the list each week. And by looking at God's Word, you can discover God's purpose for allowing the painful losses in your life. Since God is your Redeemer, He has a purpose for allowing everything, even the storms in your life, that you don't want. But the Bible says in Psalm 107, verse 20, listen to this, He sent forth His Word and heal them. What about bringing light into the darkness? We're talking about body, soul, and spirit, the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. In order to combat depression, write out your dark thoughts, then your rebuttal. I do a nighttime call-in counseling program and our theme verse for that program is found in 2 Samuel 22 29 the Lord turns my darkness into light so consider this dark statement I cannot escape this darkness I can't escape my depression well, God's light would say, the Lord will bring light into my darkness because Psalm 18:28 says, my God turns my darkness into light. That phrase is used multiple times in the Bible. A second dark statement. I feel like I have no refuge, no safe haven. The truth is, the Lord will be my refuge. Keep me safe, O God. For in you I take refuge. That's Psalm 16, the very first verse. Have you ever said, my burden is just too heavy to bear? I cannot handle it. Well, the truth is, the Lord is your burden bearer. And you literally claim Psalm 68, 19. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Now, some people say, well, I'm just afraid to be around people. Well, the Lord will give you strength to be around people. Um, in fact, 
The Bible even says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 27. The, the will is a very important part of this. People who have prolonged depression have a paralysis of the will and feel that life has stripped them of their choices. They feel stranded in the middle of the storm with no real options. But that is far from the truth. While it is true that life is scattered with unavoidable discouragement. You can avoid letting your mind become drenched with discouragement. That is your choice. It's an act of the will. You know, after an initial downpour, I know some people just stay in bed. They procrastinate. Uh, they choose not to rely on anything that they could do for themselves. Uh, Instead, you can choose to get underneath God's umbrella of protection and rely on Him. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust God. Trust in God. Trust also in me. See, you can choose to trust the Lord with your life. He is worthy of your trust. Even if you don't feel like it, Listen to uplifting praise music. Keep your living environment uh, bright, cheerful, clean, uncluttered. By the way, a lot of clutter adds to depression. Clear your home of objects associated uh, with the occult or the demonic. Resist long periods of time literally just on the telephone or just watching television, which can keep you from accomplishing what God has for you to do. Write thank you notes. Write encouraging notes to others, people who've done meaningful things to you. Set small, attainable goals every day. And look for something you can do for someone for someone else. And you will experience God's truth that indeed, it is more blessed to give than receive. Acts 20, verse 35. This is a short acrostic on the word conquer. The letter C is confront all the losses in your life. So you allow yourself to grieve. By the way, when you're grieving, your healing. In fact, the Bible says there's a time to grieve, a time to weep, a time to mourn. The O in the word conquer is offer your heart to Christ and give him control. Just confess every sin. He will cleanse you of your sin. The Bible says if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The letter N in the word conquer is nurture the thoughts of God's love for you. Notice his love will not end. I love this verse in Jeremiah 31.3. The Lord says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. Repeat that six times a day. Thank him for that truth. The Q in the word conquer is quit all negative thinking. I'm talking about replacing all negative self-talk by focusing on what is positive. In fact, the Bible tells us what we're to think about. Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Let your mind dwell on these things. That's Philippians 4, 8. The you in our word conquer is understand God's purpose for allowing your personal pain. God promises to use your heartaches for your ultimate good. The Bible says we know that all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. So he will use it for good, even if you don't see that now. 
The letter E in the word conquer is exchange your hurt for thanksgiving. Literally choose to thank God even when you don't feel like it, even when you don't feel thankful. The Bible says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You say, well, I can't thank God for that. I, there's no way. I'm not saying thanking him for it. You can say, thank you, God, for what you're going to teach me through this circumstance. And the last letter in the word conquer, R, remember God's sovereignty over your life. He promises hope for your future. The bottom line is this. God knows where you are right now. God knows depression. He understands depression. And he has a plan to enable you to be more than a conqueror. That's what the Bible says. It isn't just conquering something right now. What we read in the Bible is we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He loves you. He has a plan for you. He will not give up on you. Whatever has you pressed down in your heart, allow him to hold your heart, to heal your hurts, and to give you his plan for your future. Your future belongs to him, and he knows what to do with your life every single moment. You can trust him with your life.